Everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, today we are talking about hard to handle the life and time, the life and death of the Black Crows. Um, <laughs> Steve Gorman's memoir. Uh, Steve Gorman, of course, is the a uh, one of the original members and the drummer for the Black Crows. Um, the, I gotta tell you, this book, like we've been through this twice, right? We, yeah. We've kind of tried to fully digest it and i've got to say that uh regardless of how you feel about the black crows uh, this is a really really intriguing listen oh it's a great rock and roll book i mean yeah. uh, like you're saying we, we've been through this twice what he means is we've listened to this book twice yeah. and not just listen to the book twice but you know i've been doing a peripheral research listening to other interviews from other members because there's, of course, the controversy that Steve Gorman introduces in the beginning of the book. Like he he states, you know, there's obviously multiple perspectives on this. You know, this is my version. Right. Excuse me. And so, you know, I, I've been I have been going through and listening to other interviews, of, you know, around the time of this book being released or before kind of hearing what other people have to say. Yeah. And it's interesting because he is aside from the Robinson brothers who are kind of, you know, obviously the, the point of contention and the, and the, the figures in the band that people are the most familiar with, obviously um, he is the only original member that kind of made it through the entire uh, life cycle of the band um, up until the end anyway. Right. Well, and he left for a time there in like the arts. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's interesting too, because I think there's another member that people may not um know the name of but they all they see in their mind at least i do when i think of the black rose and that's that it's johnny colt right yeah he, he's right. the person you kind of think of as having the look of the black rose outside right. of the robinson brothers um and you know it turns out you know he's a little he was a little bit of the beating heart of the band outside of gorman you know right um, so I, I think he he becomes an important character that you um you know, you don't know exists. You know, he, he is the all epitome of the bass player, right? So the a lot of people say the bass is the instrument that you don't know it's there until it's gone. Yeah. And sure. I think I think that, that that he is the epitome of that. You know, when when he leaves the band, um, you know, very seldomly is there a record that is like bam boom pam, you know, like yeah. going to the top of the charts. So it is, you know, once he once he goes, it's kind of the, the beginning of the end. Yeah. And I, you know, as a band, I think they had an interesting trajectory. Um, you know, oh, yeah. I, I fall off at a certain point. Uh, not that I was ever like a super fan, but um, peripherally familiar with pretty much everything they did through, uh, I, I guess, the third record. But right. Well, uh, but mean, maybe we're jumping in too far, right? Maybe well, we should just start at the beginning. We should. That's fair. I would just say that for, for most people, they're a rock band that when they come on the radio, you don't change the channel. Yeah, fair Whether enough. Whether you like it or not. It's there. So they're you know them well enough to like, oh yeah, this is a good song, right? Yeah. You know, for the most part. So and I and I think that's a that's an interesting point and something that, you know, for the context of you know, if you weren't around or weren't a fan of music at that era, um, it was a weird time. And he talks about this as we get into the book, but um, they were sandwiched squarely between uh, Guns N' Roses and Nirvana, right? Right. Like yeah. you had Appetite for Destruction and and then, you know, halfway through their career, grunge breaks and that's the new thing so they're kind of you know we're perpetually this odd man out but they were still recognized as like um like a legit rock and roll band you know they they didn't come across as being gimmicky i guess for lack of a better descriptor yeah i mean they they emerge and they're a um you know like no frills like they're not a hair metal band so that immediately sets them apart yeah. Um, th their record is coming out like in on the tail of like in the successful half of the 
the new term of appetite for the destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so you have the, to the mainstream, to the majority of people, it's like all of a sudden you have some rock and roll that's not um eyeliner and um you know like um androgyny right. um and so it is in a lot of way and and like you know riffy steve Vai, you know um solos um so you have this kind of breath of fresh air in fact uh really early on in our friendship jason i remember we start to, you know we were getting into one of these things that should have been a podcast if only they existed <laughs> right 30 time. years ago or yeah 25 right. years ago right we're having some wicked conversation over beers about music and you're like oh you go it's the early 90s and like a few rock records come out and we're talking you know you know and you say appetite for destruction guns and roses and then black crows you know yeah hard handle and it's and and it's like huh or, or shake your money maker it's like huh right like um and i had to think about i've been thinking about it for a long time and mm. you know you, you're totally right it, it it set this tone and it was a breath of fresh air but nothing new i yeah. mean it's like keith richard says no i i wrote them you know <laughs> it was right. like it was it was a regurgitation and 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 no one in the black crows outside of you know maybe chris robinson says any different you know they yeah. they they mine the coffers of those of the faces little feet you know uh you know the rolling stones sure for all it was worth right so that's a good place to start. Uh, their their debut album, um, "Shake Your Money Maker." When that came out, I, I guess prior to that, they were an Atlanta band. Um, they were a local band. They were known as Mr. Crow's Garden. Um, by most accounts, not a great band. Well, um, and they were because they were trying to ride the horse of like college radio. REM, right? right. They were kind of aping REM a little bit, and. Uh, for people that I know here in Atlanta that were around during that time that saw them, um, they, they weren't good. Like oh, they, I can't were imagine not, they, were. they were not uh, adept at their instruments. They were, you know, doing mediocre uh, original music. Um, well, because you're talking about, you know, at, at, at that time, uh, the big Atlanta band was driving and crying who um, were, were rocking like you know yeah making some really cool rock music right and so they were the darlings of the atlanta scene and then of course you had way more stuff going on in athens with you know R- rem and uh b-52s and, and bands like that athens just kind of had a more diverse um and more respected music scene at that time uh one of the things that he gets into in this almost immediately is they're talking about playing a show and going back to uh, a crappy house that they rented in grant in the grant park section of Atlanta, which um, now you could not rent a house there for. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, that, that yard is now full of um, really nice yeah, grass. There's, there's condos and yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. So, um, but one of the things he mentions, is they, they play this gig, all their friends show up, the guys from driving and crying, come back to the house and are partying with them. Um, and they're sitting there drinking beers in the yard and Chris Robinson immediately turns dark. And right. Can't have, can't, this kid can't have a good time. He can't enjoy right. it. It's like they just had the, the best show and the best night of, you know, their, their young careers. And Chris Robinson is already finding fault with this, you know, according to, to Gorman, of course. Um, so very early on in the book, he begins to paint this picture of, you know, Chris Robinson as a malcontent and somebody who uh, is constantly sabotaging any potential success that the band is, is working towards. Well, and you know, there's something to me, like there's like, he is telling stories about himself as like a, you know, a 20 year old, 20 year old, very young, uh, immature, but somehow the voice of immaturity never leaves Steve Gorman. (laughs) Like, yeah. even as he gets older, like, even in the progression of this, it was so easy for him to talk in that voice. Yeah. Like, I could, I could see it in, in, and it almost was disconcerting for me yeah. that he could do that so easily and it not take have, you like, out of the book a little bit, maybe. It, well, it didn't take me out of the book. It just like made me think, it made me start like looking at Steve Gorman and what he was saying with, with, it, it's right. one of the reasons why I buy it so much is because he was, has no qualms about introducing himself in that way yeah and he doesn't seem to 
to ever really grow out of some of those things. Yeah. Um, and so that's, I think, why, you know, maybe, you know, you talked about listening to the book the second time and, and you know, like your bullshit detector going off a little differently. Um, yes. And for me, it didn't because of that. Like, I was like, that is such a, uh, there was just an air of genuineness to that, whether good or bad, mm. uh, that, that I that I kind of like, was like, oh, wow, this is, I, you can go there so easily and that and re regurgitate that sophomoricism in, in such a simple way. Yeah. Uh or 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 simple is not quite the word, but so easily he can he can slip on that hat, slip on that 20-year-old Steve Gorman so easily that um it made it me like, like a little the like, memories were very fresh, right? Or those the feelings attached to those memories were maybe right. very fresh and something that he hadn't quite put to bed. Right. His dialogue writing is never like amazing, you know, yeah. that's why it has to be memoir style. But still, yeah. it's like, and when he said the audiobook is great, you guys, you definitely should listen to this on an audiobook if you're into it. He reads it, it's it's really good. But yeah. the times when he's ever, if whenever there's a dialogue and it's him, someone else talking, it's just like a little bit unbearable, you know? It's yeah, a little bit it's like, like it's like eavesdropping on possibly the dumbest conversation. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great way to put it. Yeah. And there's so many times where he's like, um, he's just like through the moon. I mean, Truly, he's like he talked. There's times where he talks about me, you know, rock and roll icons and yeah. people, you know, that yeah. And he's like, "It's so and so, oh my fucking god!" And it's like, "Okay, Steve, calm down." Like, yeah, I think you could have thought of a better way to present this in third person. Fair um, enough. Uh, so anyway, so I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah. no, I mean, I think I, I agree. I agree with you. Those are all kind of um, maybe nitpicks that that come up more in a second listen, but totally. uh, still, still there. Um, however, the point... does not detract from some of these, these inside stories that we get throughout the course of the book, That's which right. really was the, the biggest draw for me. So, you know, at this point we're moving into uh, they're, they're doing some demos. They link up with George. George Julius. Julius. Right. With about a hot dog from who? <laughs> George de Coulias. who of course is Rick Rubin's college roommate and so uh and really one of the most exceptional a and r guys in in the business well um, and what he was able to do with this band is no nothing short of amazing like yes this should this alone should make him a multimillionaire. but when you start looking at his production credits it kind of like fades after this yeah, that's that's true. And so he was working for A and M Records. Um, their pseudo manager at the time would like basically worked in the mailroom at A and M Records in Atlanta, and, right? Yeah, in Atlanta, and he mails in like this really sloppy demo tape. And for whatever it comes with A and M letterhead from Atlanta to the L A offices, so something that might have otherwise been completely disregarded. You know, I'm sure there's just millions of fucking demo tapes that get sent to record companies, especially back in those days. Um, but for whatever reason, this one gets opened up and Draculius hears something, here's some kind of potential, right? Uh, whether it's the music or, you know, uh, the marketability of uh, where these, you know, these guys being like a, a new Southern rock band or whatever. Um, but he's very clear with him. He's like, you guys kind of suck, but <laughs> well, that's, that's but one we of the can, best parts. Yeah. Like, but we can build something out of this. Right. When you see him pop in at the, so they play a, a show, they've been, you know, like chatting with him, you know, back and forth at, on the phone or whatever. Um, maybe he visits them in Atlanta and he's like, Rrr. but um, no, the first time they meet him, they go to New York to play a show. He shows up. Yeah, they do a he, showcase. He, that's right. And he's like, right. yeah, lame. <laughs> but in spite of yeah. that, I kind of see something, right? Right. And so that's when he introduces this idea of using open G tuning, which is, you know, it's, it's a Rolling Stones trick. And that's what he says. He's like, you got to play an open G like Keith does. Let's rock it out a little bit. None of this fucking mopey REM <laughs> shit, you know? <laughs> so that is really the beginning of it. And uh, he coaches them through this process um, and they end up recording Shake Your Money Maker with a local Atlanta guy who at the time is relatively unknown, uh, 
outside of Atlanta, certainly yeah, unknown, completely right? unknown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the name of Sir Brendan O'Brien. Um, Shake your money maker is apparently everybody of, calls him Bud. You know, they call him Bud. Yeah. Right. And there's because there's a funny story about that, right? I've, yeah. I've got a guy. This guy, Brendan, is going to be great. No, we got a guy. His name's Bud. He lives in Atlanta. He's good. same guy. Um, so Brendan O'Brien does this record and it's, uh, it's huge. It's fucking, I mean, there's a lot of like first record, um, rocket to the moon type of situations around this era. That's right. In fact, in fact, one of the, the lead single, they, um, don't want to record. It's a cover, right? It's a, um, yeah. a, a well-known rock cover and they don't want to record it. They do. And of course it's like doom 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 like it's like the the lick you hear yeah, and you go it's anthem yeah yeah for sure um so <laughs> they, they they record this record and they're looking for a home for it and it's huge but what i'm trying to get to is they were still named mr crow's garden at the time right right the label didn't dig it um you know other other people in distro were like i don't know if we can sell that blah 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 uh, at this point, Ruben's in the picture. He doesn't really give a shit. He's he's unimpressed with whatever they're doing. He's he's just kind of like doing his own thing. He's Rick Rubin and out. And uh, he pitches the name. The Cobb County Crows spelled with all K's, <laughs> which <laughs> I love that. Shit. I, I know. And it's so, you know, selfishly part of my favorite part of this book is it. Like everybody knows, I don't have a lot of respect for Rick Rubin's his producing, what? but I, but I've always said like, but he's a great business guy. He's a super shrewd businessman. Well, th some of the stories in this book dispel that as well, because you know throughout their relationship with Rubin, he'll he kind of becomes this buffoon in the story. Yeah, I'd um, like to hear the other sides of some of those stories though too, because yeah, that's part of it that like I'm like. Eh. Like, there's a couple of things that, like, okay, so you you're talking about like the the name, yep, um, and then just to like skip ahead a little bit, just to stay in this Rick Rubin lane. We're not th we're not there yet. We're not uh, there yet. You're not okay. Right. Let's, well, let's I'll have to come back. Let's, to it. Yeah, let's right. save that. Um, but he 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 does essentially he's uninvolved. Uh, he well, leaves. He's aloof. Through... Rick Rubin's aloof, <laughs> right? So. He uh Draculius leaves AM around this time. Ruben well, starts deaf American. Right. He jumps ship out to there. Meanwhile, this record is kind of in limbo. Uh they end up releasing it on American. And like I said, it's fucking huge. Uh I, I think well, and they I think did this three million in sales in 13 months. Well, so and that's this, fucking but it's like not unreal. It, it wasn't right away. It was like a and thanks to coolius he got them out on the road to tour behind the record so like which really it, that's right opening for all these bands. like but they did this thing that it doesn't happen a lot like they're opening for some stupid hair metal band the first little bit yeah another like kind of level up college radio band the next little bit and then it's like all of a sudden aerosmith uh zz top you know it's like whatever they yeah. start they start opening for these other bands and doing and arenas that's right and there's this great rolling stone record rolling stone uh story from the time and they are they are still opening but they are clearly it, just like blowing out of the box this is the zz top tour that they're yeah. the, that the this is actually from yeah um so it's it's they we, do the right thing. They're we touring. They're doing the thing. Forgot one of the most important characters in all of this story, though. I don't think that's impossible. Rich Robinson. So no one talks about Rich yeah, Robinson. Right. <laughs> so prior to this, they bring on um, a guy named Pete Angelus uh, to so manage so right. the band. Um, he's actually who puts them out on the road, right? I think he might work for the CIA because he's like one of those people you Google and there's not a no, zip, zip, down. And it's and unbelievable because this man, he managed Van teacher. Halen. He he directed the video for Hot for Teacher Which and means Jump he, he, he and Panama. Came up with the idea, he was the cinematographer. He like brought in the, he I mean, everything. 
I've got my pencil. <laughs> like, I mean, are you kidding me? So Pete Angelus is this fucking behind the scenes, you know, Svengali that yeah. ultimately makes all this stuff happen. And uh, they end up opening up for ZZ Top, right? Ultimately, yes. Yes. Um, so they're out on the road. There was ZZ Top. And, and this is where the, you know, Chris Robinson up until this point has like in press made jabs at other bands and kind of uh, began to develop his pugilistic sense of, uh, you know, how he's going to interact with the media and with his quote unquote peers in, in the music business. <laughs> but, I love that. but this is where it really, you know, this is where the fucking rubber meets the road. Well, it's also too, it's this thing where um, uh, it's and you're right. And there's, there's a part of this book that isn't enough. Uh, Machiavelli, right? And and it's the Pete Angelus like um, using Chris Robinson as a like um, a mouthpiece and letting him get in trouble, point him in this direction of this thing, and then going like uh, and then grabbing him and pulling him and pulling him in this direction of this other thing, and then letting him run his mouth about that. And and you know basically they're on tour, and at this time every big tour was sponsored by Budweiser or Camel Cigarettes or whatever right. it was. And that was because then the band didn't have to pay shit. They didn't have to borrow money from the record company to do anything. They just like got to go do this and it didn't cost them any money. They made a bunch of fucking cash. Yep. They, you know, like they could be in the big hotels. All the Miller Lite beer you could drink. Sure. More importantly, all the Miller Lite beer, you know, whatever. Those, that they sold you know, at the concerts, right? yeah, or, or those five twenty year olds could drink, you know. Um, but like, um, so you know, Chris Robinson somehow becomes offended that um, the tour is sponsored by a beer company. Yes, this is Easy Top Tour is sponsored by Miller Lite. Um, Chris Robinson makes a statement in a I want to is it a Rolling Stone article? I, I, no, I think it's a um, I think it's actually like a um. Because it, it would have been that one. No, I think it's a like a radio interview. Okay. And he it's says some, something about light beer, L-I-G-H-T. Like, I don't drink that shit. Well, the powers that be behind this tour lose their shit. They're like, yeah. he's slagging off our product. You know, here's this upstart band. We brought him on tour with ZZ Top. And <laughs> these two like, guys in a drum machine. Yeah. They're slagging off our product. We're not going to tolerate this. So uh, they give him a little, uh, a little, you know, brow beating about it. Which, um, if you know this personality, it's like bringing the gasoline to the already raging bonfire. Right. You know, it's like so. So next opportunity he gets, and he's out really on the stage. Like yeah. He starts this tirade about how you know the Black Crow's music is is brought to you by us and. <laughs> we're not for sale and you know all this you know corporate we sponsorship by a is... record company three days ago right. <laughs> right um but you know what's so funny about this and it's the typical bullshit like you know um and and you know this this irony is pointed to in the book you know shortly thereafter but we didn't say this spoiler alert but um uh you know like and it's biting the hand that feeds every time you know yeah. and um you know, not to take the wind out of your sails, but like, just so you all know, um, this gets used to their advantage in such mm -hmm. the most fantastic way. In a beautiful way. And and in and, and this is Pete Inglis, Angelus, Inglis. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so this it, continues perfectly. on, right? And they say, quit talking shit on the mic. And of course, Chris Robinson's like, fuck you. You can't tell me what I can say when we're performing. <laughs> um, at this point, the tour manager says, look, you say one more fucking thing. You're off the tour. And that's it. Um, Pete Angelus gets wind of this. He says, Chris, come here. Just just hold it for a second. Okay. I'm going to let you. Until I say when. Yeah. Wait, until you can see the whites of their eyes. Hold. Hold. Right. So what's going on in the background is the Crows signed a dog shit deal with Rick Rubin. Um, on a record that ends up selling three million copies in yeah, thirteen not, months. Not only does he get a piece of the, and the, and at the time, 
record deals were bad, but they weren't usually this bad. Like yeah. this is like a bad record deal he now. Dog fucked them. Right. Like they, he gets a Rubin, piece of their merchandising. He he got a piece everything. of their of their, All their publishing. publishing yep. Everything. Right. Yep. So in the background, what's going on is they have a uh an option for a second album coming up and it's incumbent on the record company to to move on that within a certain period of time and that deadline yeah you're free and clear right that deadline is rapidly approaching pete angelus knows this and he says don't say anything just keep your mouth shut for a little bit until they get to the hometown show in atlanta they do two nights on the second night, Pete Angelus says, let her rip. <laughs> and, of course, Chris Robinson starts spouting off the mouth. The tour manager loses his shit, kicks him off the tour, and all of a sudden, this is a big news story. And I can see the MTV news. like da, 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 da. Yeah. Right. Um, so what this ultimately does is the, uh, the, the deadline for the option is passed. So, not and while only Rick are... Rubin's like wringing his hands, <laughs> watching the news in in between wrestling shows, <laughs> right. he gets a phone call. Oh, they didn't file the paperwork. Yeah. So Pete says, "You know, what are you guys missed the option? What are we gonna do here?" Yeah. What's what's Got the deal? The biggest rock band in in the world right now, the biggest young rock band who just sold. 3 million copies out on the road over this last year. And uh, we need to re renegotiate this deal. So he ultimately ends up reeling and clawing away all the bad dealings that Ruben had on that first record. And it was all done beautifully in this giant PR stunt with the, with the Miller Lite sponsorship and the, the ZZ Top tour, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and, and 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 honestly, this is a continued. This cycle rings true throughout the fucking story of the Black Rose. Yeah. The English swoops in and gets them turned right when they were turned wrong, in so many ways. And and one of the things that this points I, out to I me, I think it's evident that they would not have made it past Shake Your Money Maker dude, had Pete Angelus not been managing them. Well, a they'd still be bums in Atlanta if George Crutelius didn't. Hear something from them. B, if you don't have B Inglis as their manager, you pretty much can be sure they never get past that. Right. Agreed. And so it's just this you gotta have these patron saints along the way, or things go things don't work out for you, you know. Yeah. And I think that that's the, those are two of the the things. And, and apparently, also, if you're not a Red Hot Chili Pepper, Rick Rubin is not your um, guardian angel. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, you should you should watch out for that. Um. So. As we kind of move into the next the next album cycle, this um, is where things start to get hinky, right? This is well, where, yeah, it's kind of where they get the their their um their poop stops start starts stops manufacturing bad olfactory senses. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like, um, you know, they. This, this is they, also where Chris Robinson falls in love with the Grateful Dead. Well, he's starting to right. He, yeah, he, he doesn't quite do it all the way until, um after this record like okay he's it's starting to happen but yeah it's not all the way there i mean honestly you know this is the you know um steve gorman says it anyone else will say it um this is when they're at the height of their powers right they bring on mark ford excuse me you're absolutely right because we're we're talking about southern harmony music we are yeah. we are right. they're at the height of their powers this is like this record is amazing but you know what here's the problem there is still not a single knew, fucking Black coming. Crows record that has, like, that's from A to Z, a good fucking record. Like, they have good songs. Like, mm -hmm. they're all EPs as far as I'm fucking concerned. Like, yeah. there is not a record that's, like, you put it on and you're like, damn, that's a good song. Yeah. Damn, that's a good song. You know, where you say that to the end or, like, and you're like, man, I didn't really see this for the really cool thing that it is, but it's amazing. It's like yeah. four or five songs. I mean, it's gr it's good. Those four or five songs are great, but yes. it's not a whole record. You know what I mean? Right, right. And that's so, fun to me. But so Southern Harmony again, um, O'Brien 
uh, engineers that one as well. He comes back, George Julius is producer, Brendan yeah. O'Brien, who at the time has gone on to do really cool things. He started working with Rick Rubin. Um, yeah. And, Did you know, STP core. Yep. Well, he's he started really doing his he's he's making a name for himself and making the sound that we know to be the Brendan O'Brien 90s sound. Right. So and and he is doing other things. Of course, he is. Um, he's the engineer on Blood Blood Sugar Sex Magic, which is another giant fucking hit. Um, he solo produces STP Core, uh, Stone Temple Pilots, right? Their debut album, which was a huge seller. Uh, I believe he begins his relationship with Pearl Jam somewhere around this time. So he's got a lot going on. Brendan O'Brien is is off to the races. He is no longer like this local Atlanta fixture, right? He's he's nationwide now. Yep. Um, he clearly got the respect he deserves. Yeah. So Southern Harmony, I don't remember that much about the band during that time. I th think you're right. I think they're still doing a lot of touring. Um, I believe this is when they tour with uh, Robert Plant, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, after you, right, Robert Plant. Uh, I think that yes, they were tours with Robert Plant. I mean, this record is a sophomore record that defies the you know the normal kind of sophomore slump thing. You yeah. know, it sells more copies. It's a good record. It, it, they grow. You know, they they become a, a new version of themselves. You know. It's easy to see that in the first record, they're they're putting on the skin of every other, you know, faces, Rolling Stones, Little Feet, whatever. So they they kind of start to jump that that ship a little bit. I mean, Southern Harmony is, you know, uh, tattoo you, um, you know, like um, Exile on Main Street, but you know, uh, with Oregon and that kind of thing. You know, it's 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 their version of all that stuff. But yes. they all what they also do is add, you know, they add Mark Ford in guitar mm -hmm. um, and they add um, Eddie Harsh. on That's keyboards. right. On keyboard. Yeah. And and without that organ and without that guitar, the band would be that, you know, four piece, you know, rock, band. straightforward rock band. Right. right. Um, and coincidentally, one of the other things that comes in with uh, Eddie Harsh's joining the band is essentially the introduction of hard drugs that's right um primarily in this era i think they're Sweet. they're doing a lot of blow um you know i i don't know that that's fully reflected in the music is as, as much as it will be in in later later records where it's kind of right. a little more evident what's going on but um that's where where gorman kind of delineates where things went from you know drinking and maybe smoking a little bit of pot to like you know the drugs really entering the scene and of course Absolutely. eddie harsh was like he's an older guy he played with a bunch of blues le blues legends he's um i think he was from detroit um and he by most estimations um his musical prowess was several notches above where the rest of the guys in the band were at the time well that and mark ford you know you Everyone talks about how he love they these two players level them up musically, right? You know, and make make Rich Robinson and and Chris Robinson seem like and you know and Steve Gorman, you when you look at where the three core members are coming from musically, you know they learned to play in their twenties, you know, yeah. and 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 Rock, Rich Robinson case in his teens, so they're all in this rudimentary sense of their instrument. Now they do the touring, they rock out with other people. But they really need these other musicians to join the fold to start to reflect and amplify what they can do naturally. Right. To you know, to like give their talent the next level up. Yeah, for sure. So um Southern Harmony sells a lot. So it's, it's a big record for them. They 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 do a lot more touring. We said I think they tour with Robert Plant during this time. Um at the end of this, this is where we run into uh I think that it was called the High as the Moon tour. That's right. So this is kind of like the end of Southern Harmony. They're they're finishing they you know, back in those days when you put out a record, you might tour for you'd go out on the road as long as people would have you. That's right, you like know? eighteen, so you, twenty months. Yeah, you they probably toured on that record well over 
a year, right? Right. So, um, as he tells it, they're all pretty fucking threadbare by the time they come back, and uh, you know everybody kind of needs a break, and that's when. Um, but they also have money, so right, so they actually go on vacation. Yeah. Uh, that's when like rich robinson decides he's or uh, i'm sorry chris robinson decides he's going to move out to la um and they they kind of become this uh they're not just dudes banging around in in a practice space in atlanta anymore right that's right they're all living in different states and um and kind of you know getting together to rehearse or record or demo or whatever uh, becomes a bigger deal. It's like, you know, now you're not driving down the road. Now you, so everybody's got to get on an airplane and, and converge in one spot to uh, to get this done. So this is around the time. I, I jumped the gun earlier, but this is when <laughs> Chris Robinson starts really getting into the Grateful Dead. Right. Um, and he's also kind of feeling himself, and he decides – that this next record he's just now feeling himself <laughs> i'm pretty sure Chris well, Robinson has it, always it's felt all himself. it's all levels right right so um he decides that he is going to produce this next record himself and things things begin to get interesting well and, you know and, and you're telling this in a linear way and you know where we are but like yeah. what i think is funny and and you know we're talking about southern harmony and the way that that record happens you know it's really a sober affair right that you know like maybe they're smoking a pot maybe they have a beer here or there but yeah. they go in there and they bang the record out right because yeah. you know they've been touring they know these songs they've they they you know they put some shine on them and then there it is yeah but it's not like the you know like if you watch the um behind the music from vh1 on the black crows and i'm pretty sure it's on youtube um you get the sense that like like even during this era like you know they're fucking drugged out and it was crazy and there's this like like decision about the band at some point where they're like they're gonna decide that it has this fog of you know hard drugs and all this stuff and that's there eventually yeah but it's it's not with the kind of like um air that it, they're saying it has like rich robinson by all accounts barely drinks yeah. let alone did you know did her drugs but like this vh1 behind the music you know there's a part where chris robinson is like running his mouth and he's like yeah and and it, there's a point where if like you know i was on my bus and rich was on his bus and it was like if you get him drugs and i'm gonna fire you and you get me drugs he's gonna fire you you know and it's yeah. it's just like ridiculous yeah it's you it's, know it's, for the sake uh, of having mythology them. building right 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 and, yeah. and it just it comes off at the time as it does now gross and like yeah. unnecessary yes and and by most accounts like Chris Robinson wasn't necessarily doing a lot of drugs either. He right. He was, you know, dabbling in, with cocaine. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's kind of it, you know what I mean? He's starting to hang out with the Hollywood set. And um, like I said, he's, everybody's has money now. So money's coming into the picture in a, in a much bigger way. And uh, there it eventually is going to lead to, contract negotiations of who has the rights to the names and this kind of stuff but totally so at this point chris robinson decides he is going to produce the next record Uh, he knows better he doesn't want to be a quote-unquote dumb rock band anymore uh he wants to be you know emulate more uh of his heroes uh in the grateful dead and coincidentally this is you know, Brendan O'Brien doesn't end up producing this record for that reason. But there's also a funny anecdote that kind of coincides with that, um, that I think speaks to um, some of the understated pettiness of, of <laughs> Rich Robinson, which uh, do you remember that one? I don't. When you, when you started saying that, I'm like, oh, oh, no, no. I it, okay, So ahead, please. there's there's a point, like I said, they're, they're all getting money now and uh, they're they're recording at one point and rich has bought several expensive cars. Like they all bought cars, but rich bought like uh, a Porsche Boxster and, you know, some other expensive sports car that you well, know, people in the nineties would have been stoked to have. Totally. Um, and, and, and this is actually like, just to point this out, like this is a point where I went, Oh, because 
you know, Rich and Chris write the songs. They they have the publishing money, so they get money that's like far and away way more than than yes. anyone else in the band. Even if you're a full paid member who gets you know royalties and you know checks yes. from touring and all that stuff, if you're not getting the publishing especially in the 90s you're not getting dick like yeah you know you have chris and rich robinson becoming multi-millionaires and everybody else making a really good living sure not it's like it's like you know all of a sudden your friends can fly in you know first class or on their private jets and you still have to fly coach basically but you're all all in the same game yeah which which happens it totally happens but it also points to you some of the like of what i can see as steve gorman's like 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 kind of his his you know feeling. yeah it's, it's maybe this one of the seeds of his uh kind of uh disgruntledness right yeah because um, every time he points any of this stuff out he's there's kind of like a little you know yeah, there's um, an undercurrent of of sour grapes about it for sure totally totally um so in this story rich pulls up and he's he's got his new car um and Brennan O'Brien walks in and he's just busting balls. And he's like, cause he has like a, a friendly relationship with these yeah, guys. He figures these are my friends yeah, from the same city. And like, you know, they recorded these, these first two albums together and, and Brennan O'Brien's like, Hey, who parked that Ford probe under the basketball court or under the basketball hoop, just busting balls. And uh, this sticks in rich Robinson's head and rich Robinson, when, Brendan's name comes up to record this next album goes, no, fuck that guy. He was super disrespectful to me. Not working with him. Yeah. This is the guy that produced like, you know, your smash hit album or uh, technically engineered. engineered right? right. But yeah. So um, I, I thought that was funny and it was definitely like a, a little window into maybe the inner workings of his mind. If there's any, you know, veracity to that, to that particular story. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say because like, you know, I mean, there's probably like five people in the room at the time. Like it's really hard to, to, you know, verify. Right. Yes. Um, Yes. And that's a great point because one of the things that you brought up that you noticed was there is a line in book right around this time when they're talking about the dismissal of Brendan O'Brien that, Gorman states that he makes a recommendation to Jeff Ahmet to use Brendan O'Brien to produce uh, what it would be verses, right? Yep. So he paints it as he basically gives them his number and said, I know the, the perfect guy to produce your next record. Right. However, as you pointed out, and we, kind of discovered in in other discussions around this brendan o'brien already knew those guys yeah he, he engineered 10 yeah so mixed i'm sorry mixed, mixed 10. He, yeah he, he did the mixing for 10 so he ostensibly already knew these guys so whether this is just a, a misremembrance which it probably is I, you know when you're dredging up memories from 25 30 years ago uh, for the sake of, of putting together a book, these these things are going to happen, and you get yeah. things, you get wires crossed in your head, and it's just it is well, what it is. And he but, could have said that to Jeff Emma, and and Jeff Emma was like, "Oh, thanks," right? You know, not trying to like you know uh, like to be for doing anything weird with the conversation. Uh, we know him, like blah blah yeah. blah. Just being like, "Okay, cool, let's." Yeah. Or in his mind, he's like, "Good, that's just, okay." Maybe they're thinking about it, and they're like, "Oh, he's like, okay, check number two. Sure, um, but it. it you know, it it does at a certain point. It did like make me start to maybe look at some of the other statements in, in the book with a little more scrutiny. Right. No. No. Totally. Well, and and as you're saying, like you 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 might misremember a bunch. You know, certainly he's having um to go back and re- research things and like things like that may not have like been something an editor is going to like double check um, because. You know, how are you going to um, unless you are some weird Pearl Jam fan and are going to like get in the weeds on something like that? You know, um, I don't know anybody like that. No, you, neither do I. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're not going to, you know, double check that or even even think twice about it. So, yeah. 
excuse me, but but to me, it does set up this like, huh? Like you start like I started questioning other things because it's easy to like fall into Gorman's camp. You yeah. know, he's he's the drummer. Everybody's he's saying all the right. Him. He's saying all yeah. the right things. Like I already right. don't like Rick Rubin. I already don't like Chris Robinson. Right. So exactly. like I want to be on his side, but if I'm being completely honest, you 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 do have to kind of question his motives in this stuff because it becomes very apparent that he does have an axe to grind and all this. And it it's you know, is it betrayal? Yes, for sure. There's there's certainly a sense of that, but it's also money. So uh, it's you know, big those, time money. Well, that's those the thing two that... things married together. Fucking you know, forget about it. Yeah. So that's the thing that like um. You know, and and at some point, you have he does as the drummer in this rock band, you know, um, and he talks about later on the book, he's like, you know, these guys all want to stay at the Four Seasons, you know, basically my money so that I could stay at the Holiday Inn because he's just making drummer money, right? You know, and, and Chris and Rich Robinson are like, you know, making the publishing, all that stuff, which right. is a whole different level, yes, I they mean, are at a different plateau of wealth. Right, and, and so he will ever see in his career, and and as your the release of this book is like 2019, mm -hmm. and what we you know like, and at the time like and still now, he is in like some most all of the really good stuff that came out of the Black Crows, Gorman still owns a chunk of he yeah. still owns a little, little pieces of so he's right. supposed to be getting royalty payments this whole time along, what we know now as of like two weeks ago is that they have been in a lawsuit for a couple of years yeah. trying to get an eye on the books. And there seems to be some sort of resolution kind of coming about now. Yeah. So, so it could have been that this book was in like a way to turn the screws on some of that stuff. Sure. And, and they were of, trying to claw the pieces, the small pieces that he owned back from him. That's right. And in, in some of the ways, like now that I hear, now that I know that hearing some of the interviews that I've listened to from Rick, Chris and Rich Robinson, you know, they basically, you know, I feel like Rich Robinson has no reason to carry a beef with for Steve Gorman. Yeah. Um, but he had in these interviews, and I couldn't fucking figure it out. Cause it's not like he loves his brother. I mean, he he probably loves his brother like he has to, but yeah, he, he doesn't necessarily have like a love for him. And if it were me, like I mean, I'd be like, damn, this drummer's great. I love being I love playing with him. I can see no reason because Rich at least still you play. have an ally to keep your fucking egomaniac brother in check, right? Right. Well, and 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 nowadays, Rich Robinson will play with Mark Ford. Will play with, you know, Sven, you know, and play with, yeah. you know, these other people from that band, but he won't play with Steve Gorman. And I couldn't figure it out. And then when this lawsuit became public, I was like, oh, ah, uh, uh, it's a money, uh, it's a money thing. It's yeah. it, they're all getting pissed about money, and that's. You know, that's that's one of the things about this book now that I'm like, hmm. Yeah. You know, there seems yeah. there's a little bit more of it in in the in the mix, you know. Yeah, it reads different uh now than it would have in 2019 when it as came out. the kids say, it hits different now. It hits different, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so so where we find ourselves in the timeline is basically he's trying to produce this record. They're pouring money into it. It sounds like shit. He, uh, he being Chris Robinson, um, is trying to create a, a mood and wants to record like late at night. Um, the guys that are in the band that don't do drugs are having a problem with like, you know, bringing any kind of energy to these sessions. And they basically end up with this record that is a complete dud, um, which was titled Tall at the time, mm -hmm. which apparently is like uh, a jazz term for being high that. <laughs> uh, that Chris Robinson found himself kind of enamored with this language, right? And um, that changes at some point. And they bring in another producer because they can't they can't sell this record, right? I my 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 memory is getting a little fuzzy about the, well, um, well, the well, details it's not, of it. It's not just the producer. Like if you hear Rich Robinson talk about the this era, he he doesn't have any of that like um you know uh you know it was this drug thing that his brother was trying to do it was this he just he he thinks he owes the the terribleness of this recording era to the engineer he blames okay. it all on the engineer at the time really yeah it's really interesting to hear that because there's none of this like 
all of the things that Steve Gorman puts on the list, um, Rich Robinson is just like, yeah, it was just it was the engineer was shit on that. Mm. And that's what that was. And it's like, yeah, wow. Like, you know, and it, it, I think it pays tribute to something that Steve Gorman wisely puts in the beginning. And that's, hey, this is my perspective on the whole thing. You know, right. but it's really cool to hear the other people's perspective because it, I don't know, it like shifts yours a little bit, you know, as it, as it goes around, you know, it's, sure. it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, this some of these songs get re- re-recorded, and this comes out as Amorica, which, um, you know, I thought it was a bigger record. Like, my remembrance of it was- Amorica? Yeah, was that it was a bigger record than uh then it's painted as in, in this book um apparently it it didn't do terribly well i mean i guess if you're stacking it up next to shake your money maker what what are you expecting right but, i mean um, 11 on the charts isn't awful i mean that's no it's, it's, the top it's not US and charts. there's some like you know there's some great songs on there like wiser yep. times and um I think conspiracy it, conspiracies on there uh an interesting side note is we're talking about the drugs and stuff. I don't know if you remember um, the CD kids. There used to be these things called CDs that you have to put in, in <laughs> the do. player. Um, I remember all that. Often have images on them, right? Yeah. They have silk screen <laughs> images on. And the um, the the picture on the disc for Amorica. We're not talking about the. Um, the uh the 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 cover right because that's a whole different conversation Mm -hmm. but the disc itself had a silk screen image and it was a poppy with a fishing hook coming out of it huh so i mean big yeah it took up the entire disc so when you're talking about like trying to project this uh persona of being like you know in this heavy drug days which was what you know the mythology that Chris Robinson was trying to build at this point in time, uh, what better way to do it than put like such a, a kind of uh, poignant image on the, on the disc itself. Right. It's like, this, yeah, that's this music is drugs. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, you know, there's this thing that rock and roll has to be. It, I was reminded of this because I was just watching this um, uh, spinal tap. Uh, thing like this little snippet of them on um saturday night live and they did this <clears throat> you know whole little thing that goes on the show and you know they they talk about uh being satanist spinal tap and um the how it's dangerous and blah blah, blah. and I, I i was like oh yeah like um in that satiricism of rock and roll Errors reminded that there is this thing that you're you're trying to be all the time and that's dangerous and on the edge and right. something your parents don't want us to listen you listen to and yeah. you know all that stuff that they're always trying to be and so it makes sense that they would be trying to project that. Mm-hmm. Um, I to me I don't I don't I mean I remember the whole blue about the pubic hair on the cover of Amorica, right? Which I thought which was just was terribly taken- stupid. From an image, uh, it was a Hustler magazine cover. Yep, from like was, the 70s was, or something. Yeah, and it was a girl's bikini that was an American flag, and there was like a tuft of pubic hair coming out the top. Um, you know, they kind of, Gorman talks about it is, is he didn't he didn't like it, and he thought it was stupid and uh, infantile or whatever. I, I never had a problem with it. I, I thought it, you know, in the realm of, record covers it's um it was fine you know yeah i mean especially when you have black sabbath paranoid or anything you know right it's not herb albert's um you know tijuana brass with like the girl all covered in whipped cream or whatever right um i mean it's interesting because this is another time where um you know you have this uh, like kind of unnecessary controversy like what another thing that you kids don't remember about cds is that they'd be in all these stores and there were like big box stores at the time that it was yes. important to have your music in, you yeah. know, it'd be like, if you weren't couple, in Best Buy and Walmart and you know, whatever right. you, you, you were, you've cut your sales to a fraction of what they could be. That's right. And so, you know, like 
there's somebody in the control room as they're as they're kind of like wrapping up the recording of this record and it's some dudes in suits and they're introduced and they're like oh we love your music and you know I, there's something said by steve gorman's account that like um you know uh chris that throws chris robinson into a tizzy and he's basically like you know says something an terrible exact from best buy yeah and and they say he says some shit about best buy and basically says what are you doing here get the fuck out of here you're not you're not cool our our fans don't buy their music at fucking best buy you know and I mean? it's like it's like yeah they do dude yeah they do uh, yeah because not everybody has like a cool local record shop if you live in podunk iowa no offense to iowa but if you live out in the sticks like and you're driving you know, this to... is this is pre-internet. You, it would be hard to mail order stuff back then, unless you were like part of one of those Columbia House kind of programs, right? <laughs> unless you got one of these for a penny. Um, right. Yeah, no, I think that that you're exactly right, and um, and and you know, honestly, like I bought records at that time. I bought CD CDs. I bought CDs at that time. Sure. You know. Yep. And I didn't buy a Black Rose record. Fuck that. That wasn't cool. So fuck yeah. you, Chris Robinson. You weren't cool. <laughs> like yeah. um, that know, ship and, had, had sailed for sure. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 you know I bought records at a lot of places or or CDs and and one of the places was the mall and and there was the cool record store. But you know like the last thing I'd be seen buying at a cool record store was fucking the Black Rose. Like, you know yeah. at that time, especially when I was a kid and impressionable and and I I cared about what someone saw me buying in some, what place. Yeah, because you know? that would have been 1994, I think that record came out, 93 or 94. Um, so they would have been competing with like Rage Against the Machine's first record and, you know, fucking Tool Tool's and, first record. Yeah, yeah. yeah like the, the tide was so, and, yeah. yeah. The tide were, had so shifted from Black Rose, yeah. Right, for sure. So um, that, you know, that kind of, signals the beginning and the end and there there is like this very much i think this is where he tells the vma story about like how um no because Co cobain would have been dead by then yeah but but, but, but before, it, it does yeah. yeah it does signal this idea that like they had this moment where they were relevant and then the direction that the music business moved happened so quickly that you know they only had this this small window of, you know, their time in the sun, right? Yeah, but like even well, here's the thing that I will give to Pete Inglis, and I'll give it to you, you know, all the other people in the head office of the Black Crows, and 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 the the songwriters, you know, and Chris and Rich Robinson. They continue to from Amorica to Three Stinks and a Charm. They continue to write songs that occasionally are pretty amazing. Yeah, you know, or or at least so poppy they're good. You know, mm -hmm. and they have that like bubblegum stick to them, right? Because they continue to make videos, they continue to get airplay, they continue to make money, and I think this is a time where it actually pays off that they become, you know, Chris Robinson becomes enamored with the Grateful Dead because they get on like horror tour, on horror tour. That's right, yeah. horror tour, and they and they start to be able to be a like a um, theater band. jam jam adjacent. Jam yes. adjacent, but they yeah. they can tour and do theaters and pack them out. Yes, and make money. They they be, they can like convert it to a career. What what's the other one? The um like the Bobby Weir Rat Dog, all that stuff. Further, so they further, were doing yep. they were doing further. They were doing um, uh, what's the one I just said? Horde Horde, Horde. Horde Fest with like Blues Traveler and bands like that. So they are becoming they're they're garnering a a new fan base, like a right. different fan base. It's no longer this like you know, um sharing the Venn diagram, like I said, with with guns and roses and and you know, bands like that. Now they're sharing the Venn diagram with um widespread it, panic. Widespread panic and you know, string cheese incident and shit like this. Okay? <laughs> you Which, just love saying that just to fucking tag on. <laughs> um yeah, yeah i mean but I bet, but you but, get you get the point i mean i, I think do. we're on the same page about this but it becomes important that they're a band that fucking slays it live you know yes. and right. in this era too like they open for the rolling stones on like big european arena tours and i mean that's not a small feat no no and certainly they not. and they and they talk about being 
you know, whipped into the orbit of the Rolling Stones. And 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 the other thing that I think is there are two things in this book that I think are um kind of um they give Steve Gorman credence as a drummer. Mm-hmm. And that is number one, uh Charlie Watts like remembers him. Yeah. I think is that's a feat sure. alone. Yep. That's um pretty and, good. And, and, and has some quit some after some, that. That's right. Has some nice things to say about his playing. I mean, mm-hmm. wrap it up. I mean, uh, one of it's my heart goes out and it's still broken a little bit. Um, you know, that's that drummer was the rock and roll drummer as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other is that Jimmy Page loved his drumming, like yeah. loved it, like got into it. Was like, oh my god, you and know, had, compared had, him to Bonham, according and, to. I, I mean, of course, he's born now. Yeah. Jimmy Page talks glowingly of him in, you know, the yeah. press. So, yeah, I would see no reason to think that that is not the case. And, and fact, the band as a whole, right? Like, yeah, yeah. He oh, chose he, them to be his backing band, which he, is there's not a better there's not a, a better person that can come and and give you the pass and say. Well, you, you know, know, give you the tap on the shoulder and say, come on, boys, that's that's it. You yeah, know? no, I agree. Rob, well, not just him, but Robert Plant loves them, too. Yeah. So like so that's rock and roll royalty. Those are the, the, the Mount Rushmore of real rock and roll. Totally. And and I think that, you know, I, and I agree with you that Jimmy Page was so enamored with them and so like. In in enjoyed by playing with them that he was putting up with a bad back that he was doing these other things to the point where he was like hey i have these licks like kind of in my case tucked away that you know maybe we should get them out and see what we could do with them yeah um is pretty amazing yeah um but in traditional like uh we're gonna wreck our car with our own hands style they basically tell him to fuck off you know it's funny though because okay so in a couple of interviews let me tell the story so they're they're they've they're they're ending up in this theater. I'm gonna fast forward for all of you. They've played theaters for a while. They've recorded a couple albums. Um, Jimmy Page, uh, they go to London. They play live. Jimmy Page comes out and plays a couple songs with them. There's an electricity. Everybody feels it. Um, and they're like go, about to go back and play in the states. And and Jimmy's like, "Can I come?" And they're like, "Fuck, you should come." So they do this whole thing, you know. And and there's a live at the Greek uh, album. Yes. And it, it's okay. You should all listen to it. Um, uh, but um, like, really, Glow, it should, glowing endorsement. It should be. Be- <laughs> it should be better than it is. But yeah. it's it's fine. Okay. Um, but like, I mean, if you're into you know, yeah, Led Zeppelin for, songs, for not played Zeppelin by Led Zeppelin. Completist, sure. For, yeah, but so um, so he's a- another toward- masterful stroke by Mr. Pete Angelus, who totally agreed that set up that that whole Didn't thing. Agreed. So um, they're playing, they're in Los Angeles, they're doing the Greek recordings. And as far as Steve Gorman's concerned, Jimmy Page goes to the brothers and says, I have these songs tucked away. Why don't I pull them out? The rich specifically, right? Yeah, he's he took if Steve Gorman's to be believed, he t- he t- he tells it to both of them. But Rich specifically says, We're good. That's not a thing. And and you know, in fairness, because well, Jimmy the, Page says when he talks to him later, I knew I should have talked to Chris, not Rich, about. Oh, uh, okay, okay, then okay, so right, okay, um, and right, and so Rich is like, eh, you know, um, which is so fucking dumb. Yes, and so many. J- like, Jimmy Page essentially man. says, like, I know that your career is kind of in the shitter right now. And I think I can help you. You know, it might make sense for me to produce uh, maybe a couple songs on the record. And in fact, while we're talking about it, I do have, you know, I've got some songs that just I happen to have laying around, some Jimmy Page riffs that <laughs> have not fit into any other project. Maybe you'd be interested in, you know, putting these on the new Black Crows record when you guys get around to that. It's um, just a shame we don't have that. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that should be, that should have been made. And but, and during this time, they've switched record labels because after Three Snakes comes out and Tanks, it basically submarines American recordings, right? American, <laughs> American. I love that. I love that they make a record that basically <laughs> sinks a record label. Well, so the way he tells it is that you know, Ruben had made so much money 
off uh <laughs> shake your money maker and and southern harmony that like he he basically you know squandered this money on on chasing these other acts and nobody ever provided a return like they did and so well, by the time three snakes comes out it fucking it sells fucking bupkis and uh you know for for good reason it's it's I don't think a great album uh, by anybody's estimation, but and you think Rick Rubin would have been way ahead of that. I mean, but you know, like I don't, I don't buy that. Like that red labels. Yeah, no, under... that, that that one's one of the ones that I go, eh, I don't know. Rick, yeah. I mean, I, you know how I feel about Rick Rubin, but I think he's smarter than that. Um, and, and also it's like, you know, fool me once kind of thing. I don't think he would well, let anything had... slip at that point after. And he then had... he had be, be made blood sugar, sex magic. He was the Rick Rubin that we all know now. Yes. But Blood Sugar Sex Magic wasn't on American recordings. No, it wasn't. So he just produced it. Yeah. But you know, he had I, I mean, look, I know, it. I know fucking Danzig 2 didn't sell like <laughs> Blood Sugar Sex Magic, but it, I think it sold. I think it, right. you know, I think he made some money off that record. Anyway, you're getting getting aside. Uh he Us. he signs a distro deal with uh Sony Columbia. Uh enter Don Einer, who is basically the cookie cutter it, like he is the archetype of the shitbag old school cigar chomping fucking uh musical exec suit right um and so that's who they're dealing with now and they're basically having to jump through hoops and and don honor doesn't give a shit he's like basically pulling the old school thing that that all music industry guys did back in the day which ruben did on on their album which is do a cover do a cover you're not trying to sell anybody new stuff the cover will sell right because people are familiar with it and it's just uh you know there's quiet riot doing come on feel the noise or you know there's a million examples of this and it always fucking works so this is what don einer is pushing for them to do at this time and uh, well, and they're looking for like a way to please him, but not do that, but not do a cover of it's only rock and roll because that's a little too on the nose, you know? Oh, my God. There's, <laughs> there's things that I'm glad that don't exist in the world. And that's one of them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, you know, you're 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 absolutely right. And this is also where you start seeing um, uh, Johnny Colt leaves the band, mm -hmm. if not at this point, just before it, um, uh, you know, and, and he, by his account. It's because he'd gotten sober. He was protecting protecting his sobriety, and the band. He he actually. This is a quote: "The music was terrible. Yeah. Like it just oh, wasn't that's good." What he said. Yeah, yeah. He said like the music they're making wasn't good. Yeah, and I was sober, and they weren't. So obviously, and I wanted out. Yeah, and um, you know, Steve Gorman has the best things to say about Johnny Colt, and so does everyone else. Like literally, everybody has good things to say about this guy. Well, that's that's really all you need to know. I mean, right. that that says a lot, right? Yeah. Uh, the the point that I was getting to with introducing Don Einer is that lightning strikes twice for the Black Crows because this Live at the Greek album is something that they do independently. Pete Angelus, you know, independently puts this deal together, and for whatever reason, Sony Columbia misses the deadline. For the yeah, option. That's right. For the new record. And meanwhile, they're out touring with fucking Jimmy Page. And they cut this record. And they're blowing up, right? They're, 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 they're stars they're rising. They're back right. in the spotlight. They're back. And Columbia never gave a shit. They never gave them any push. Um, and Pete Angelus gets the, once again, the save and comes in and, uh, you know, is negotiating with, with Einer saying, Hey, we're free and clear. You missed the option. I've got this. We don't owe you a fucking record. Yeah. We've got this I got live record though. with yeah. Jimmy Page in the can, but you know, you guys missed your fucking deadline. And of course, you know, as the story goes, Einer's, you know, uh Yelling. dragging dragging legal temps, you know, up and down the hallways and flogging them uh because they <laughs> they missed this deadline. Yeah. But um but that never happened. Like you have you ever heard of that happening in a, in another context? Usually, when and you then hear to something have it, opposite, 
yeah. yeah. You usually hear how the record company got them because they didn't do a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then it and then you have a bad record and they just fucking shelve it and maybe it never comes out. That happens a lot, right? Yeah. So to have that happen twice in their career, it just shows you like what kind of dumb luck these I don't it's see, not, but it's not dumb luck. That's right. It's Pete Angelus. It's and Pete and, Angelus. And and here's the thing when you go his Wikipedia is like this big. Yeah. It's he's he's the fucking he's in the CIA as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Like he is like that person who goes, <laughs> Oh, you put that clause in the record contract again? No problem. We'll mm-hmm. just wait that out. He's just a brilliant strategist, you know, strat. Yeah. strat. He he is Machiavelli, right? Yeah. And and Gorman certainly in this case. Yeah, and Gorman talks still talks, says good things about him. Um, you know, it's interesting. This book came out and the Robinson brothers were about to do a tour to re, you know, go out. They were going to play shake your money maker all in your face for the next year, which, you know, I guess there's people who want to see that. And it's interesting because the quote that really like, you know, Chris Robinson was going to talk shit about this no matter what. But the quote that I found that really kind of burns this for me is one from Rich Robinson and says, you know, they ask him, you know, did this, um, how do you feel about this book? Like, what do you think? And said, he said, it didn't really affect me or make me sad. No one really takes Steve that seriously. He was our drummer for a long time. And a long time ago, he was our friend. But he was also the one who kind of schemed the most and was more willing to allow division between me and Chris. Rich added that he remembered Gorman telling me that the scariest thing to him and, and some of the people in the band was that Chris and I got along because mm. then they couldn't change our minds. Interesting. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, and I think it's, man, I wish like I could believe a, a word that came out of Chris Robinson's mouth, but I'd <laughs> like to, I'd like to hear more from Rich because I think he might, he, he is a, when He's hear, more apt to let some of the truth slip. Than, yep. Than when Chris. I hear it, there's a great interview. <clears throat> um, you know, one of the music um podcasts I really love is Dean Del Rey's Let There Be Talk. Yeah. Um, you know, he talks to a lot of people. He was in the music industry, so he knows a lot of these people. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of cool um come through. If you um don't want to listen to a fanboy, um, you know, like glower at the glimmery boots of whomever he's interviewing then don't listen to this but right he's um, not asking the tough questions but he well, gets a lot of really great guests yes he does he gets a lot of great guests and occasionally he asks a really tough question while he's giggling it at them okay. like he asked he asked rich robinson is it true that you didn't oh, want to let you didn't want to record jimmy, with jimmy page? page he asked yeah. him that and he oh, says good. well he said um yeah, well, Steve's old and he doesn't remember things. So, you which, know, I don't, and he says, I don't remember it that way. Which we know to be true as well that, you know, people misremember things. And uh, absolutely. But, it, it, but it's, thought, it's, it, it's hard, you know, it's hard to be clear headed about this because, like you said, you do, you do tend to lean one way or the other. And as a reader, you do want to pick a side. And, and the rest of the story is so compelling that, like, um yeah i i i tend to want to believe what steve gorman is saying because a lot of it particularly as it uh as it pertains to chris robinson's personality rings true for what you see in his his own interviews so there there's some of that but you also you gotta have your bullshit detector on a little bit because otherwise you're you know you're just drinking the kool-aid and that's not good either well, and I mean, I think, you know, it's one of the things that like lured me before was that at the beginning he states, you know, this is everybody's got the perspective. This is mine. I think that's important. Um, but when I like and the thing I was saying is like, if you go listen to Dean Del Rey's interview with Rich Robinson, man, I got this different feel for Rich Robinson. And when I listen to Rich Robinson's interviews with Chris Robinson, I'm like, interesting. Mm. Is, like, he doesn't seem to be like throwing the bullshit that Chris Robinson is trying to live on. Right. And, and, you know, and also I think if you listen to interviews with Chris Robinson too often, which I may have done, you start to like hear him t- trying to quib, um, you know, uh, like philosophically, like wax philosophically over all yeah. these rock and roll interviews and shit. Like, and um, one too many times he uses a, you know, like, 
uh, 12th grade, grade level vocabulary word in some sort of like uh, lofty way. Yeah. And it just starts rubbing wrong. In fact, to the point where I have trouble with his lyrics right now because mm. of, of listening to him talk on the way, the way he does. But um, you don't like Rich, it because he slammed Eddie better in a song. Oh, well, I mean, I like that song a lot, not even yeah. knowing that, you know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, I think that that song is great because it does talk about the the fads and the come ons of 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 the music industry and how they box and cajole us all into believing that we love genre right. and 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 this kind of music and not that kind um mm. you know and so i think that part of it i think is great um but i and what i'm what i'm trying to say in all of this is that i think rich robinson may be the person we could listen to to get the clearest view of some of this stuff, especially from that side of the street. Right. Right. He can provide that third perspective that um, totally that brings clarity to the whole picture. Totally. I think, I think anyone, I mean, there's not a lot of gems in the Dean Del Rey interview, but it's yeah. good to get, it's, you get kind of, you start to develop his voice in your head when you're mm. thinking about and talking about the black Rose. Yeah. So closing, closing out with, uh, with the book hard to handle, um what what are your kind of final thoughts is this something you would you would recommend to a friend to listen oh, yeah. to oh yeah i think i think if you like rock and roll and you know this era of rock at all or you know if yeah. you don't and you're like a, a a a younger person that's like just kind of like you know starting to feel this music out um it's a great rock book it's a great yeah. you know you know like um it's it's told well um there are the parts that are self congratulatory and like maybe a little too I don't know. All you... part and parcel of a, a memoir, really. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. have you ever read absolutely. a memoir that doesn't have a little bit of that? Um, no. It's no. it's few and far between, for sure. But, I've recommended uh, this book a lot. Yeah, I liked it a lot, too. Uh, like I said, enough so that I listened through it twice. There's a lot of great behind-the-scenes stories in there. Um, a lot of, uh, like I said, a lot of these characters that pop up, like the Pete Angelis of the world and um, a guy that we didn't talk about, John Kalodner, who mm -hmm. um, well, that's right. is kind of like the blueprint for Rick Rubin's guru phase. Like if you look at <laughs> pictures of Kalodner back then and Rubin now, like I think you can see some parallels. Um, and so all those characters are present. It's really fun. You get, you get a, you know, Don Einer, um, you get a real good feel for like what the music business was like before uh the napster age right and the collapse of that so uh i would definitely recommend checking it out and yeah for the rest of you thank you very much for joining us we really appreciate it uh we try to do this kind of stuff pretty frequently so check back with us and uh we'll see for you sure. next time always see you guys again soon